My name is Deborah T. Gold. And I'm Adrienne Cohen. Um, tell me, how did you become interested in gerontology? Almost by accident. I had spent 10 years of my life teaching in a high school, and uh, I couldn't teach to kill a mockingbird one more time. So I decided to go back to school for an educational administration degree. One quarter of that, and I knew I couldn't do that for the rest of my life. So I was sitting in the women's room at Northwestern, like this, uh, wondering what I was going to do. And this older woman came in and said, what's wrong with you? And I told her. And she said, oh, listen, go downstairs, sign up for the human development program. You'll like that. And I did. And I, we had to take three pro seminars, one in childhood, which was okay, one in adolescence, which is the one I thought I would love, having worked with adolescents for so long, and it was okay. And then one in adult development and aging. And I had gotten the, the lowdown from the other students that this famous gerontologist, Bernice Newgarten, was coming over to teach that and I was kind of excited. I had never had a really famous professor before. I went into the class on the first day, and there was the woman in the who had been in the washroom and who told me to go uh, do human development. That's great. And she was mesmerizing. And from that first lecture on, I was hooked. Mm. She was a social psychologist. I ended up having a career very different from hers in terms of the substance of our research, etc. But I always have her on my shoulder, and she she was truly the reason that I am an agent. Mm, that's great. Um, so this kind of builds on that a little bit, but can you describe your career trajectory as a gerontologist? Well, when I finished my uh, degree at Northwestern, Bernice again speaking with great wisdom, said, you need to go do a postdoc at Duke. If you're serious about aging research, everybody has to go through Duke. And I said, okay, the first time, and it worked pretty well, so I said, okay, that time. And I applied to Duke and came down, and I was told that the mentor I had applied to work with wasn't available, but they were going to have me work with somebody they thought was pretty good. Uh, and her name was Linda George. And to go from the queen of the beginning of the study of gerontology to the queen, in every sense of the word, of gerontology and social sciences over the last 20, 25 years has just been magnificent. So, and again, Linda does very different research from me, but. I learned about being a scientist from both of those women. I learned about the importance of integrity, of identifying colleagues being so important, and of never giving up, no matter how hard the research you were trying to do was, that if you just kept working at it, you would eventually come up with an answer. It might not be the answer you thought you were going to get or that you really wanted. And I decided to stay at Duke because the aging center there was my textbooks on aging come to life. Mm -hmm. George Maddox was down the hall. You know, Bud Bussey, the founder of Giro Psychiatry, was up two floors. Dan Blazer, Harvey Cohen. We've had six presidents of GSA come out of Duke. That it, the next closest institution has two. So being in a place, living in a place, working in a place where aging was the key was extremely important and beneficial. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I've been there now for 29 years and uh, have ended up in the medical school, on campus, doing a variety of different kinds of research, but always the importance of aging and understanding aging has been the emphasis of our center. And what more could you ask for if you wanted to study aging? At what point in your career did you embrace gerontologist to describe yourself? Well, I'm not sure I ever did. And part of that, I think, is a direct influence of 
both of my mentors, neither of whom really called themselves gerontologists either. I envisioned myself a sociologist of aging or a medical sociologist of aging from the moment I decided to stay at Duke because I was staying there because of the aging component. But um, gerontologist was, in my estimation, someone who had had formal training in aging, which was something my cohort didn't really have. Mm -hmm. I had a course from Bernice in adulthood and aging, and a few courses where aging was a small part of their curriculum, but I really didn't have training in gerontology. Mm -hmm. I hope I've trained a fair number of gerontologists myself, mm -hmm. uh, but it's a, it's a semantic issue, and I'm not sure uh, that I see myself any differently from people who see themselves as gerontologists. It's just the term doesn't get used. Um, so in some ways you've answered this, but I want to put it out there anyway, which is um, about female mentors. So you've mentioned two already, um, but did you have any other female mentors who either uh, uh, impacted your, your, your movement into the field of aging or who have been there along the way? Were there any other women? Um, early in my career, um, Mildred Seltzer from Miami University was uh, a mentor and I, I invited her to participate in a symposium I was putting together for GSA and she was one of the most gracious, uh, s smart, insightful, quick-witted people I've ever had the opportunity to work with. And I think Millie was a large reason why I looked into issues of health and aging uh, in particular. So that's mentoring long distance, but it works really well, even though those were the early days of, uh, of email and other communication devices. Mm -hmm. uh, Lillian Troll, who was also uh, in, in Chicago for a while and then went out to UCSF, uh, studying families and my early research was actually on sibling relationships in later life mm -hmm. and that's what I thought I was going to go into and then I ended up having an opportunity to study osteoporosis so I look at the biopsychosocial impact of osteoporosis on older women mm -hmm. uh, and in kind of a funny way uh, Cookie Schutz, Carol Schutz who who was at GSA from the day she graduated from high school till about five or six years ago, um, really taught me a lot about policy, a lot about how an aging organization ran, mm -hmm. and how to work well with other people who were also eager to look at the phenomenon of aging and understand it. Mm -hmm. What do you think is unique about being a woman gerontologist? If you read the literature on families, on relationships, on caregiving, women are the kin keepers. They're the ones who make sure everything is working. They're the ones who are inclusive as they organize opportunities, whether it's a class or a symposium or a family reunion. Mm -hmm. um, women are better mentors than men are, in my estimation. Mm -hmm. And part of that is because I think women worry less about deriving success for themselves from entering and are more concerned with the success that will follow for their mentees. Mm -hmm. The men I've worked with over the years at Duke and elsewhere say, wow, this, this guy's turned out to be a really good mentee. I've had eight publications that, that he's put me on. Oh. Well, no. That's not the way you look at what is going to be most helpful to people. And um, I think a, a sensitivity and an understanding of where people are in their life course, of what their goals are, of what their capabilities are, and a certain amount of, of intuition, which again, I think is more a women's uh, skill than a man's, will make for a better mentoring experience. Mm -hmm. I have once, one student was my undergrad student probably 20 years ago. She took all four of my aging courses at Duke. 
She went to the University of Florida to medical school, came back to Duke to do her residency, did her fellowship in geriatrics, mm -hmm. and has now joined the geriatrics faculty. And she says to me, you're the reason I'm here treating older adults. And I say, wow, those lucky older adults, isn't that the most amazing thing? And she's now mentoring women to bring them into the field of geriatrics as well. So that's the kind of thing. You see where that mentoring is going mm -hmm. as opposed to what it's done for the self. That's great. How has being a gerontologist impacted or interacted with uh, your own personal aging process? I'll confess something to you and the rest of the world. Uh, when, I, when I was in grad school, my mother, who was in her 70s at that point, made a comment to me and said, you know, you think you know about aging, but you really don't get it at all. And I was very hurt. And I thought I did understand it. And 30 years later, I know she was right. So I think as I've gotten older and as I've recognized the way that manifests itself in what my self-perception is and what I can do in the way I interact with other people, in the way I think about the future, how could that not affect what you do in your research when that's happening in your personal life? So I think it, it is profound and I think there's no surprise that some of the most brilliant gerontologists have done their best work toward the end of their careers. Yeah. Huh. So the Wiggle Project focuses on the legacies of older women gerontologists and within that framework is there anything else you want us to know? When Bernice went into gerontology she was really, you know, a pioneer. And when I went into it, we were, we were in the second and third generation, and my students now are going into a well-established area of science. Um, but I do think that a legacy for people in aging is that to try to help make aging as positive as it can be. Now, I happen to believe that doing good for older adults is not necessarily keeping them alive as long as you possibly can. And I teach death and dying as, along with my uh, aging courses, and I believe that sometimes there are things worse than death, uh, and that we have to make choices for ourselves and we should be free to make those choices. I hope that there are people who understand that better now, who are becoming physicians and researchers in the health areas, uh, and who can continue to say aging is about quality of life and not quantity of life. It's about benefiting from waking up in the morning and not just hanging on. Um, and I think this project is playing such an important role in helping people to understand just what a critical issue aging and women has been. Mm -hmm. If you look around the country and you look at people like Carol Estes and, and you know, I mean, there are Mae Weichel, there are hundreds I could name, they have made a significant difference in the world they're in, mm -hmm. and it has been a difference that will carry on long after they're gone. And that's, to me, what gerontology and being a woman is about.